Thank you. My name's Steve O'Connor. <laughs> I'm a uh, Go programmer based out of Brisbane. I've been a core contributor to this fine project for around a year now, and it's been very helpful for me to um, dig up some really old projects I've been working on over the years and try and get them over the line. So what I'm going to do with this project and this presentation is basically just show you what's possible with the Go toolkit, um, have a look at the state of GUI development within Go very briefly, and then cover some items like uh, we'll bring up some development stories, a little gopher will pop up and say, hey, how about we do this? We'll go through implementing that, and then I'll attempt to do a live demo of that running on the screen. Then we'll look at some things like test-driven development, cross-platform <laughs> development, and touch into mobile, and some of the other exciting things we're doing. This is an all-volunteer project. All the resources are at find.io. And if you're on YouTube, then look down below and there'll be more resources there. OK, um, there's always been really good tools around for doing GUI development. And when Go first came on the scene, we had Go wrappers over the existing like, SDL, GTK, QT, whatever. So that meant you could write Go programs very quickly using the existing C libraries. Uh, recently, in the last year or so, there's a number of pure Go toolkits that will write directly to like an OpenGL layer. And that's where Fine fits into that. Over here, we've got a picture of Andrew. He's the lead on the team. And he's written a book there that you can find on Amazon. Awesome Go has a curated list of a number of toolkits. OK, we'll jump straight into Hello World. Very small program here. We've got four or five lines of code. Can you see my mouse cursor? Very good. Create a new app, new window, set some content using a vertical box layout, stack a couple of widgets in there, call show and run, and we have a working window popping up there. Too easy. OK, let's see if we can just fire one of those up. So there we go, there's our hello world running in fine. Hover highlights over the buttons. All done. Like most toolkits, we have a kitchen sink demo application that demonstrates the current state of all of the widgets that we have and all of the code. You can then go in there and pull that out to see how various things are done, include that in your code. I'll just quickly fire that one up. So here's a demo application with all the things. Got a number of buttons, all the usual input fields, checkboxes, radio buttons, slider control, progress bars, a form wrapper so you can have uh, labels and input fields all nicely formatted, automatic binding to cancel and Submit buttons, scrollable areas, all covered by the toolkit. Number of graphics widgets, including some built-in SVG icons that are basically there as resources that you can use inside your application as well. So there's a lot of tools there that will very quickly get you up to speed if you've got an idea. Jumping around. With Fine, all of the output is scaled using floating point numbers. So you might have noticed with GTK, you can do GTK scale equals two, and then it'll go at like double size, but you can't do those little gaps in the middle. Uh, Fine is all floating point by default. We just quickly pull that up. So here's my window. I can change the scaling to say 2.1. And you'll see it grow very slightly. Yep. That's quite handy if you've got some embedded devices where you want to do very specific outputs on them. And you can get your scaling to exactly match exactly what that hardware might look like. So a quick recap of what we've just covered so far. Um, we're in 2019, and we're at a point now where you can use Go, your favorite tooling, to write little GUI applications, it's not a problem. There's, there's a number of options that are available for you. Hello World, for example, four lines of Go code, works quite well. 
there's enough example code there, including complete widget sets and some example programs and games that you can fire up to dig into, see how things are done, and start your own project. Next. OK, a little gopher pops up. <clears throat> so let's say we have a, a frame buffer device with, say, 64 pixels in a square, and we want to animate that using Conway's Game of Life rules. That's one of the example applications. The code behind that now, we'll look at the animation loop. So we have here a simple go routine, fires off a ticker. We're pulling from the ticker channel six times a second. And then down the bottom here, generate the next iteration of the screen and then widget.refresh. That's very simple code. It's using standard go tooling. It's using all the good bits like go routines and channels. And you'll notice here we're actually painting from inside of a Go routine. And if you've ever done any graphics programming, you'll quickly realise that uh, they have this affinity to the main thread. So trying to do a separate thread over here that's painting to the screen is problematic. That's all covered within the Fine Toolkit. We've taken care of all of the multi-threading problems that you may have with other toolkits. A little bit of code there. That just shows what we're doing internally to take the current data set on the board and generate the next frame in the Game of Life program. It's just looping through x, y coordinates. Uh, if there are two or three neighbour cells that are populated, then that cell stays alive. Otherwise, it clears it. And then we just set that into the buffer. Quickly jump to the next one. This is a a custom draw routine that we're attaching to a custom widget. So you can write one of these that will return a standard go image.image, .image, and then you can put whatever functions you like in there to get data out of the current state you've got, use standard go functions to generate a new image and return that. Fine will then take the image that you've returned and worry about blitting that onto the screen in the correct main thread and everything else. OK, quick demo. Over here, we have the examples application that comes bundled with Fine. There's a number of different little toys and tools there with all the code behind that that you can dig into and see examples for how to do various things. We'll have a look at life. So here's our little program that we just looked at a second ago that's doing an animation loop six times a second, taking that frame buffer information and blasting it out onto the screen. And again, there's one function there that is needed for your custom widget, which creates a standard Go image structure and returns that. We'll have a look at one other one while we're in here. This demonstrates a different way of doing custom widgets. This is your standard Mandelbrot set. So with this custom widget here, this takes a different type of function that takes an X and Y coordinate and returns a color that is represented at that pixel. So if you create a custom widget using that fractal method there, what uh, Fine will do is every time a repaint is required, it will iterate through every pixel within the display, calling your custom function to get the color that needs to go in that image. So for example, if we... Uh, if I scale that one up, if I just drag the window, that'll cause a repaint on that window. So when I release the button here, Fine will then go off, ask your program what the colour value should be at every single X and Y, and then it will just repaint. And it's quite quick. Got some keys here so we can zoom in. And have a look around. Performance is pretty good considering how much work is going on there and how simple the code is in your custom widget to achieve that. Makes sense? Okay, let's quit out of this. Quick, quick, quick. So, a small recap on that. Basically, using all the good bits of Go, 
all of the hard bits are hidden away by the toolkit and you can get in there and start hacking away very, very quickly. Okay. Gopher's come up with a tricky one here. With that particular life program, we did spend a couple of weeks on that one online working out a lot of memory leaks, buffer overflows, and there was some very, very tricky data race conditions happening in there. So when we got to the end of that little project and optimised that so that it was working very nicely with little code, we, we were saying on a Friday night, wouldn't it be cool if we could just plug a basic interpreter into that and turn it into a retro gaming console? Because it's the same concept where you have a, a simple frame buffer of 60 by 60 pixels and you just want to be able to address those from code. So on Friday night, we had a look around and sure enough found that someone had written a basic interpreter in Go. So then uh, finished off my beer and got coding and by the end of the weekend, we each came up with a very separate implementation using those tools. The approach I took was to write a virtual machine emulator in Go that probably sounds a little bit <laughs> overwhelming, but it was actually very simple. It's, it's basically just mapping a frame buffer, creating an animation loop, and then loading in the, uh, the basic interpreter to run some instructions. Over on the right-hand side here, there's a, an example basic program that will animate a bouncing ball bouncing around the screen and off the walls and everything. In order to hook that into the virtual machine emulator, the, I wrote, I had to extend the basic interpreter to enable the program to read and write into the frame buffer, give it a way of getting input via a key interrupt, and then generating a vertical sync interrupt here to tell the basic program that the animation cycle is complete and it can go and paint a new screen. That's a lot of words, but over on the right, there's the basic program to do that. And this is just using off-the-shelf stuff that we found on a weekend, so... OK, let's see if we can run that. Gopher wants to have a play. So there's our little virtual machine running the basic program, doing a physics engine to animate a ball floating around. And there wasn't really that much code on there to do that. All of the code is again linked on the um, on GitHub. <laughs> Thank you, that's really cool. And if I move the keys around, I can interact with that ball to push a vector on there and make it bounce in different ways. And if I hit the escape button, that powers it off. We've even got static emulation on there. <laughs> and up it comes again. So that was a very small program and that was something we knocked out on the weekend. Good fun. Oh, we have a friend. He wants a game for two players. Okay then, let's try it again. Here we go, same, same concept, we've got the same emulator. We've just written a little basic program that will emulate the good old Pong game. Using VI keys to manipulate the paddles, of course as you do. So there we go. I, I can never win at this thing. <laughs> so that entire thing took me probably up to Saturday night. While that was happening, Andy in the UK, he lives in Scotland, went off and did something very similar, using the same tools, but to come up with... Whoops. Something quite different. He wrote a BBC micro emulator <laughs> that you can program yourself. And everyone's first basic program, if you can remember this one. Oh no. Live coding. Love it. Blue. Oh, that'll do. Ta-da! <laughs> so 
Thank you. Good fun. So what, what I'm trying to get at here is that Go is a real compiler, so you can write real programs with it very quickly. There's no messing around with hairballs of JavaScript. There's no messing around with trying to get the right link libraries in C to, um, to not completely take up your entire weekend. And, and, and more importantly, Go is such a good language that you can hop on the internet, find really cool and weird things that are written in Go, and after a short read and a beer, you can understand what they're trying to do and how to get in there and change it. <laughs> and, and maybe even hack what they've done to change it around and interface it with your own silly ideas. And it's all easy and it's all good and it's all very robust. You should do it. You might remember recently someone wrote this awesome Game Boy emulator for Go and put that up on, it's been floating around on Slack for a few months now, but um, we thought, okay, that's cool, let's take that and do a fine implementation of it. So about three or four lines of code to wrap the existing Game Boy emulator in a fine app. Yes, we have it here. I've heard this music so many times, I'm sick to my back feet of it. <laughs> so I have done some rehearsals. And being a fine application, we inherit some cool features like the ability to scale it automatically. Very smooth. You paid so much to come here. <laughs> nice. So, lots of fun. Um, one, one last quick one. This one's fairly important because it... it it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is using the SVG features built into Fine. Um, this, this took us a lot of work actually to get right. It was very quick to get the solitaire working, but then to make it work well, probably took a few months of late nights. Gopher wants us to play, can't let Gopher down. Let's fire up solitaire here. This is part of the example set that comes with Fine. So once again, you can just grab the code off the internet, have a look at how this one's done. They're all done slightly differently. And you can use that for the basis of um, a project you might want to do. So we have these lovely SVG rendered cards. And I've got a bad hand again. This is not unusual. If I click on... Oh, what have I done? I can't see the screen here. Oh, here's one. That 9 can go on the 10. As I click on the 9, that becomes transparent. Um, Fine natively supports RGB and A as in the alpha channel for transparency. So you don't have to do much code there to achieve that. You just say, set transparency on this item down to 50% and bang, that's all drawn nicely. Um, we find that converting SVG to bitmap, which is what is happening here, obviously, is quite computationally intensive. So we've done a lot of optimization here to intelligently cache the results of those computations and hold on to them for long enough. So there's like a last recently used cache happening in there that will clean itself out automatically as they're not used. Um, as a result, the whole thing performs quite well. And of course it's scalable nicely, very smooth. And I don't think I've finished a game with this in a long time. I just get stuck in these death loops, so... Yes. There is a minesweeper there. It's not on this particular list, but it is on the fine repo. That would be Say again? Oh, maybe next weekend. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a good plan, though. Time's short, so I won't go through all these in detail, but that's just a recap of where we're up to. Okay, so that's all good for fun and games, but what about using this toolkit to write some real line of business applications that you can rely on? 
And that is mainly what we're doing this for. It's not just for the games. So testing, we're very big on testing. Test-driven development is one of the main tools that we're trying to achieve here. And again, if you've ever done any front-end work in the JavaScript space and had to do commercial Cucumber type work, you'll realise why they put developers on the first floor so they can't jump out the higher windows. <laughs> Whereas Go Tooling, <laughs> oh, you agree, that's awesome. The, the test tooling in Go is superb, and it's such a shame not to see that being used in important line of business GUI development. Is that me banging the microphone, is it? I have to cut it down a bit. Okay, so we have mocked drivers and mock widgets for everything, so you can basically get in there and write your application, write the business logic for the application, and test it with going through and clicking everything, making sure the contents of Windows come up in the right spot with the right content without once displaying a window. So you can get all that working, create your test jig, and then start writing your application, knowing that at each change that you make, you can go back there and run your regression tests and prove that it's working. Uh, video down the bottom there, we do have a, a YouTube channel where there's a bunch of tutorials. I won't go through that right now, but all the links are there, go have a look. Cross compilation, we've got an online service for doing cross-compilation to a number of different platforms. This is basically a Docker pipeline tool that's been built up by one of our contributors there. Android and iOS, you can take your fine application and using our Go Mobile-based build pipeline, convert that directly across to an Android or an iOS application. Pixel perfect, that's gonna be big. It's not finished yet, there's a lot of work to do on some of the finer parts, but we're really looking forward to that. Follow the progress at the link below. This is good. WebAssembly. Take your fine application that's running in a canvas on your native app, generate WebAssembly, and run exactly that thing pixel perfect inside a web browser. The same that's running on your mobile phone, run it in a web browser at high speed. All in Go, no JavaScript, no rubbish. <laughs> We use all the things every day. Uh, we're not just Linux developers or Mac developers. We do it all. We have all the hardware there, and we make sure it works on everything every day. Andy, for example, he's doing a project in the UK with hospitals where they'll take medical imaging data off of the very expensive machines, run it up on a Raspberry Pi with a portable screen so they can get that information out in the field very quickly and cheaply. That's using Fine. Skip that. GTK has GNOME, QT has KDE, Fine has, we have our own desktop. <laughs> this is mainly for those little medical imaging applications, so we have a base there that we can launch whatever our custom apps are from, but it's growing to the point where it's, it's probably a reasonable contender for a low-end desktop. Down the track, we may be up there with KDE or whatever, but that's, that's a long way, that's probably not much point doing that, but... Okay, big one. This is the last part, so I'll, I'll go through this in a little bit of detail. Again, if you've done any front-end work lately, Angular, React, Vue.js, all the other good ones. Actually, talking about good ones, have a look at Svelte. If you're in the JS space, it's a compiler for JS that compiles from your high-level code down to raw, vanilla JS, and it's really, really good. So it just means at runtime, it doesn't have this gigantic hairball trying to work out how to implement two-way binding and all the other good things that are happening. So back on the go talk. Oh no, what's happened here? Oh, this keeps popping up. It's annoying. Two-way data binding in fine, how do we do it? There's a data API that's being developed at the moment that we're hoping to release by Christmas. It's, uh, it's basically a set of interfaces defined inside Fine, where if your data can implement these interfaces, then you get automatic two-way data binding. And I'm using that in a game I'm writing where RPCs are coming in with protobuf information, and I don't want to manipulate them, I just want the data to come in 
and automatically update all the maps and all the explosions and everything else happening in the game. Very quickly, data item is just any data structure that has a stringer interface and that you can attach listeners to. So every time the underlying data changes, the listeners are automatically fired. A data map, same thing, but where the map itself is modified, new entries added or removed, then the, the listeners get fired against that. And finally, a data source, which on the surface looks like a slice of data items, but it supports lazy loading, pagination, and just makes it fairly easy. I think it's modelled on the iOS data source. The name is quite similar. So how does that affect your code? How do we go and implement this inside a program you may have written? Well, initially, we've got a number of constructors for all the basic widgets. So if you want to create a label, it's just widget.newlabel, with, give it a string, a new entry, and then you can have callbacks on there to read and write the values. New checkbox with a callback function, all very straightforward. So to, to take those existing function signatures and make them work with two-way data binding, we just have a variant that we'll be adding that says new entry with data, give it a reference to a data item, and then all of the publish and subscribe, updates, everything else, is all happened automatically within the toolkit. Which again, if you've used something like Angular lately, there's a lot of code there that's, that's achieving all that, and there's a lot of weird nomenclature that you have to go through to interface with that. Not with Find, though, because Go. So let's have a demo of this one. Oh, it's pretty insistent, this, isn't it? Who wants me to come up with? OK. So here we have an application with a window and a number of data items attached to that. I've just created one of each type here. So there's a data item of type clock, which is just a string that changes itself once a second. Um, some Boolean data, some numeric data, string data, floating data, blah, blah, blah. So this, this application here has one window with a view against that. We'll fire up another one here. This is a different view of the same data. Um, so as I change this one here, you'll see on the right-hand side there that some of those, uh, the size, in fact, is changing each time I change that. This one here, delivery time, you can see the value changing in the larger window on the right as I move that around. So this is just basically a set of widgets that are bound to that same data. And we can sort of prove that by throwing up another one and another one. And, and you'll see that as I change data here, all the global data is all changing in real time and updating all the subscribed widgets attached to that. Nice. Now, there's another button. What does this do? OK. Who put that there? So here's our fractal. If we recall, this one uses a procedural function that, given an x and y coordinate, will return a colour. So all I've done here is take a clone of that and change the algorithm so that it is influenced by the global data from the data store. That's a mouthful as well, but you can see it work here. If I go to this one and change the delivery time, that's going to change the scaling of that fractal in the blue window. So what's happening there is, as, as this slider is changing, it is publishing a change to the global data, and then all the other windows are receiving a subscription event. And we can have another one. Got to sync that one. So there we go. Everything's all changing all at the same time. And I can go to the fractal. I'll just set focus to that and use those keys we used before to change the scaling that will change it within this fractal and then tell all the other widgets that the underlying data has changed. Nice. One more button. Of course, the game of life. This is a very strange implementation of life in that I've included a number of effects that are going to be 
affected by the shared data widgets here. So if I change the delivery time, it's affecting the hue. Let's just make that a bit bigger. There we go. So I can change the colour and it also changes the animation speed. So that's going to go full speed if I got to there. And put it down the middle. That'll invert the display and again using some third party libraries to... If you recall with this one, it returns a Go image. So I can implement other third party libraries there to apply filters to that. So let's say go there. It does an outline effect, invert effect, speed it up, done. So that's a, a really quick overview of what's possible using this toolkit without much code.